Okay, I think it's um, we, we'll we'll get going now. Just a reminder to anyone who's uh, joined or who has forgotten after my previous multiple reminders, uh, the session is being recorded, and we'll make it uh, those recordings of of each element of the uh, of the day available afterwards. Once we've had time to edit them, we'll also make the um, PowerPoint slides and other, other any other materials that the speakers uh, generate available. And we'll try and uh, process the what's being the, the really good stuff that's been put in the chat so far um, uh, in the next in the next few weeks, so we can make that available to everybody who's attended the event and anyone who was unable to attend it. Um, so we'll move on to the next uh, the next session, which uh, will should last for about the next hour, hour sort of hour and a half roughly. Um, we've we're gonna start with a talk from my uh, my colleague from the University of Lincoln, uh, John Coburn, who's going to, uh, who's a, a lecturer in American studies and is a historian of um, modern, uh, modern America. Um, he's going to uh, be talking to us about small group teaching. So I will hand over to John now and let him uh, to take the take the wheel. Thanks a lot, uh, Jamie. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jamie and the RHS and History UK for inviting me. Um, and I've now got the unenviable task of um, following on from both Max and Pete, which is um, fantastic and nervy and expected dip in quality there. Uh, I'm going to try actually by sharing a link to begin with to my slides, um, because the interactive component of this, I would like people to add and edit the slides that I'm using as I go. Um, so if people can click on that link and a password should be all lowercase ntt for people to get access to those slides um let me know if that does or doesn't work and in the meantime i will share my screen and i will uh, begin with my own slides it's worked for me john and other people are putting in the chat that it works so fantastic all right we're off to a flyer um yeah, so I'm, I'm probably going to be repeating a lot of what um, Max just said in that fantastic contribution about lecture teaching, um, because I think a lot of what he said applies to the small uh, group teaching that I'm going to be talking about now. And it, it, the, the basics of teaching are kind of similar, regardless of the environment. So uh, the importance of, of preparation, the importance of uh, not overcomplicating things. Um, but also hopefully what people get out of today is that idea of confidence as well, which is obviously easier said than done, um, but is a really important component about building our own teaching profiles and just having the um, assurance that we all do know exactly what we're doing and we can be you know, brilliant teachers. Um, so what I'm going to do with this session on small group teaching, I'm going to begin with some starting points about what small group teaching is and how we can approach it. Um, and then I'm going to ask us to think about the various challenges and opportunities that, that we might confront with this um, and whether there are any um, particular concerns or worries or fears that anybody might have or any um, excitement and uh, expectations that they might have as well. Um, I'm then going to share a very boring example lesson plan, uh, offer some suggested tasks and then finish with some tips, some hacks and, uh, and a Q&A as well for a bit of a discussion at the end there. Um, so in terms of what small group teaching is and how we should think about small group teaching, um, the, the first thing that I learned and that I was told is that it's not actually about the numbers, um, which seems kind of contradictory, but yeah, small group teaching isn't technically defined by the number of, of people that you are uh, teaching. And, and I mean, it kind of is because we expect small groups, we expect a, a limited number of, uh, of people. But it is important to think with small group teaching that we're, we're much more interested in what we actually do with the teaching rather than the number of people that are actually there. So small group teaching really is about the dialogue. It's about the collaboration that we have in the learning environment. And it's about that active learning, that buzzword of active learning. These are the things that come to define small group teaching. Now, obviously, with that stuff, there is an optimal group size for those kind of activities. Um, some people say ideally between five and eight. I much prefer smaller groups, but the seminars you have are going to vary in size. They're going to vary in the number of people that are there from week to week as well. You might have rooms of 25. You might have rooms of five. Um, the smallest group I've ever had to deal with is one. 
And as any experienced lecturer will tell you, the only thing worse than nobody turning up for your sessions is one person turning up for your sessions. Um, but yeah, the, the, the thing that we're supposed to do when we're dealing with seminar groups, with small groups, is to um, facilitate their learning, it's to coordinate their learning, and it's to inspire their own independent approach to the subject matter. So it does differ from what we might expect with a traditional lecture, which is more about um, communicating and informing that learning. Um, and the good phrase that I always like to bear in mind is the idea that within a small group, we are the guide on the side rather than the sage on the stage kind of delivering all that knowledge. Um, there are various different words that might come associated with a small group class. So it might be tutorials or seminars or workshops or student led groups or uh, breakout associations or all these kind of things. Um, I tend to use the word seminar. So that might come up uh, a lot while I uh, uh, give this contribution. Um, so why do we teach to small groups? Um, it's kind of, the best way I find of teaching in history in particular, um, because it uh, facilitates that discussion, it facilitates collaboration, it allows students to question and query things in a comfortable environment. Um, the three things that come to be more closely associated with why we do small groups is that it provides flexibility. So we're able to encourage active learning, we can develop independent skills in any number of ways, and we should be flexible when we approach these sessions. The second thing is that it obviously provides engagement between an instructor and a learner. We can create that comfortable environment that maximizes the social aspects of learning. And I think the social aspect is something that I'll um, kind of feed off in a few slides time. Um, but it's also important for us to be reflexive. It provides that reflexivity. It gives us an opportunity to respond to our students within the lesson and after it and outside of it as well. But it gives us an unbridled opportunity to develop our own skills as well. And uh, being a reflective instructor is vitally important for the success of small group learning. So small group learning, it is a distinct mode of active learning. There are pedagogical merits to discussions and to tasks, particularly in history. Um, it allows us to consolidate the knowledge that students have taken from elsewhere. So the ideal would be that it would follow a lecture at some point. That doesn't always happen. Timetabling can have a, a way of throwing a crowbar into these kind of things. Um, but it should certainly follow a degree of, of prep and um, uh, prior learning and prior understanding from students that they can then come into a classroom and into a small group and we then work on consolidating and reinforcing and scaffolding that kind of knowledge. Um, it provides instant feedback as well so students get replies to queries on misunderstandings, they discover that they're not alone in their confusion and it's the same for instructors as well, it's the same for us and our learn, uh, teaching style, our um, assumptions um, can kind of fall away as well, we get instant feedback to the way in which we approach per, uh, particular topics. Um, but we also deal with small groups because it does create that comfortable dialogic environment. Students feel comfortable to practice their skills and they should be encouraged to make mistakes, to get answers wrong, to think about their learning uh, and to form communities. But we as instructors can also do the same things. We can practice our teaching skills. We can make mistakes. We can think about our teaching and form communities um, as well. So in terms of how we can and should approach this and um, these are all very kind of high-minded these are the should these are the, the best possible scenarios of how we deal with this stuff and um, first of all it is important to bear in mind that yeah telling is not teaching we might feel that we need to fill the gaps and the silences in the classroom by showcasing our own understanding and the material but we shouldn't do that instead it's for us to prod and to probe and um to to instruct and to develop um our students to learn these things in, independently um, and so essentially what we have to do is to get students to do something, be it a task or a discussion or a, a read a piece of work, they have to do something for themselves and we guide and we coordinate and we, we kind of prod for their knowledge. Um, we have to be active teachers as too, so we have to uh, listen to what students say not just in terms of the answers they give, but also how and why they might say particular things as well. We do have to consider the social dynamics that appear within a classroom, and we have to factor that into the way that we teach as well. Um, so think about groups that aren't responding, think about groups that are responding too much. All of this has to factor into how we uh, plan a lesson. Um, we have to inclusively participate as well we have to make sure that everybody contributes and participates as much as possible and with that comes um, kind of 
doing away with any assumptions that we might have about the group of people we're teaching to, because each student is obviously unique. That demands different tasks, different materials, different scenarios, different support for different individuals as well. Some can be more independent than others. Um, I forget who it was in the chat earlier. I think it might have been Sue Adams about not assuming that all students are 19 as well. That's a really important point and a really important staging um, for all of this stuff. So when we think about how we can and should do small group teaching, we must assume nothing, we must be flexible, and we must be reflexive as well. Um, but now I'm interested in knowing some of the things that you might think about all of this stuff. Um, and so I'm interested about any challenges that um, you expect to face, any challenges that you think might occur, um, and any kind of concerns that you might um, uh, have about this to begin with. So can I alter the... the screen that I'm sharing here because I would like you to go to those slides and on the online link you should just be able to click on these text boxes on these slides here and add in your own comments and suggestions so forgive people like a minute or two just to edit and add into these any challenges that you think any things that you think you might need any fees that you might have and yes this already does seem like it is working which is fantastic fan dabby dozy brilliant um I'm going to try and alter the screen that I'm sharing here though. How do I do that where we at? Share, uh, share that one. Good stuff. All right. So yeah, in terms of the challenges, these are all things that are fairly um, predictable, awkward silences during discussions and the students being um, quite shy, unwilling to respond, particularly yeah, if they are neurodiverse, if they have their own learning styles, we need to adapt and we need to be flexible um, to facilitate their learning and to facilitate the group um, as a whole. Um, groups of students are willing to speak seems to be coming up a lot but also on the flip side of yeah that yeah the more confident students contributing a lot more than others so that's something that we need to balance um, students not having done the required reading ahead of the sessions um, is, is a, unfortunately a very common one um, what else having having your authority challenge because I'm a young woman yeah um, something that almost can't be factored into any of the advice that I give here is that every one of you will, will have your own presence in a classroom. They're, the students are going to react to you in entirely different ways, um, which is why I kind of want to give everybody the opportunity to put their own challenges, their own ideas, their own fears down here. Um, because as much as, uh, as I can sit here and give you advice and guidance, it isn't going to factor into everything that you might have um, in terms of your concerns. Um, a lack of rapport or engagement with students. Feel free to add more boxes to this as well. I think you have pretty much unlimited editorial rights here. Um, so if you want to add any more shapes, any more text boxes to add this stuff in, feel free. Um, a lot of stuff about neurodiversity coming in here, awkward silences. Um, pitching your teaching at the right level for students. Yeah, um, a lot of the preparation that, that you do here is going to be about tailoring your material to the students, tailoring your tasks to the students. And unfortunately, a lot of that is going to be completely unknown until you step into a classroom and you've taught them for a few weeks. Um, so there perhaps is a degree of, of patience and getting to know people that needs to come with this as well. Um, I will absolutely let people continue to put their challenges um, into uh, into that slide for now, but I'm going to move on to the next slide, which basically just confirms um, a lot of, I guess, a lot of what you've already said here. Um, da -da -da -da. Hopefully this screen is sharing now, is it this one? So now on your screen, on the Zoom at least, there should be like a challenges slide. Is that right with list of bullet points that I've put down? Yeah, is that's, that what's working, showing up? that's working, stuff. John. Cheers for that, Jamie, yeah. Um, so I think a lot of what you've said there feeds into what I was expecting in terms of the challenges to come up um, the silences, the inability to get people to um, contribute to, to small group sessions um, and that, those, those social dynamics. Um, delegating some responsibility to the students, it's going to provide some unpredictability. And so we need to provide that, that balance between having command of the, the learning environment while also only providing influence and inspiration. So we do need to delegate some um, uh, you know, unpredictability to the classroom and learn how to manage that. There might be lack of clarity among the students as well. They might not understand the task. They might not understand what the reading meant. They might not know what a learning outcome is. And there is that potential for social disruption 
as well. So we may have students freeloading off the seminar who aren't contributing anything, but are taking up uh, the knowledge from other people. There might be students that dominate the classroom. There's also going to be wild variations as well in the learning materials from group to group, in the class sizes, in the physical learning environments. It is likely that you might teach two seminars of the same material, but within two completely different rooms. That means that you're going to have to completely change your lesson plan because you can't use whiteboards in one room because there aren't uh, uh, any whiteboards in there, but there are multiple interactive learning facilitating software and all mod cons in the other room. And um, the students are going to differ from one module to the next as well and from one seminar leader to the next, and they're going to differ from one student to the next. So you're going to have this plurality of variety in the classroom that you're going to have to tailor to as well. And beyond all of that, even if you get all that right, the technology might not work. A conversation might grind to a halt anyway. There's going to be things that you have absolutely no control over, like friendship groups falling over, falling out uh, over a pint the weekend before the class, and then suddenly the environment, the collaboration is completely dissolved. Any number of challenges that you might face, but the important thing is to be aware of the challenges and roll with that and try and work out how best to manage that. And so with that in mind, we can think more uh, about the opportunities that we might have rather than the, um, the, the challenges that we might face, we might think about the opportunities that we have instead. So same again, if you wanna add your thoughts to the slides on opportunities, what, uh, what things do you think you might um, be looking forward to? What opportunities are provided by um, a small group teaching? Feel free to go ahead and add your uh, thoughts onto that slide while I frantically try and find out where it is on my screen here. No, that's wrong. Yes, opportunities. All right, we're on. I might just leave it on this uh, on this platform now. Actually, it's a little easier. So the opportunities that we have with small groups, anything that you're looking forward to, any opportunities, and um, you know, things that you can develop in a classroom that you might not be able to do elsewhere. So yeah, building rapport with students. Um, is a, a vitally important one. It's something that we have to do, but it is that opportunity for us. Um, it is something that we can, can, can do in an uncomparable way within a small group that we could do within a lecture or any other learning environment, that connection with students. You can't wait to share your enthusiasm as well. I think that's a really kind of honest and authentic and the best part of our job really is that we can um, completely change the dynamic of a room just with our own enthusiasm and our own kind of desire for the for the subject. Um, students take you up on something you weren't going to cover, but that you wanted to. Yeah, more personalized instruction, knowledge sharing, more in-depth discussion. Um, what I quite like about jotting down these opportunities versus the challenges is that I think it's a lot of the challenges um, they will dissolve as soon as you step into a classroom. They will dissolve over the few weeks that you are instructing seminars and as you get to know the students. But these things on the screen here, they never go away. That, that chance to um, develop a rapport with students, to get to know them, to become true partners in their learning. We can watch students develop. We can engage the quiet students. We have that variation in classes, but we also have the flexibility to do something about that. And they can take forward that confidence in the classroom to their other, uh, their other lessons as well. Uh, more in-depth discussion of topic, having fun with learning activities. Yeah, there are unbridled opportunities here for us, uh, for us really to put our own personal stamp on their learning experience while they're at university uh, or college. Um, but I am, yeah, pressed for time. So I'm going to move on now to summarize some of the things that you might put down on the slides. These slides will go out to you. So I'm going to keep all of these contributions, which are all fantastic. Um, but yeah, the responsibility that we give students for independent learning, it means that it's going to force them to develop those skills. We have that incomparable opportunity to scaffold their skills over time to support their development as well. The social aspect of learning is heightened. So on the one hand, there's more opportunity for disruption from the dominant people and the freeloaders and quiet people and whatever else it might be, the dynamics, the interactions on that day. But we can foster that collaborative learning with one another. We can develop a rapport with our students. The social aspect of learning is so important, particularly as we move from pandemics uh, learning. I think a lot of the intake this year will have had two years during their uh, A-levels, for instance, um, that was purely online. 
And so we're going to have a challenge to get them out of their shells and have them collaborate in person with one another. But that's a really fantastic chance for us to do that. Um, the flexibility, the interaction, the engagement obviously comes into that as well. But we have the authority to form a comfortable routine environment. We get to create a more relaxed, tailored, personal learning style. We get to develop and test new ideas. And everybody in the classroom gets the opportunity to be wrong as well, both the students and the instructor. Um, so I hope just listing down the challenges versus the, um, the challenges versus the chances that we have here, the hopes versus the fears, hopefully there's a lot more in that hope category than we have in the challenges and those things will just um, dissolve. Um, if I was to give the best piece of advice to maximize those opportunities and limit the challenges, basically it comes down to being prepared, but not overcomplicating in, in your seminars. You have to think about who the students are, what they will need, what you want them to do, what the learning outcomes are. So you need to be prepared before you step into the classroom. You need to think about the aims and objectives for that class, what you want students to do beforehand, during, after. You need to be able to communicate that with clarity. You need to plan your tasks around those learning activities and consider the best way to spur your learning. You need to prepare the, uh, the classroom in advance, so go and scope it out. But you also need to expect certain things are going to go wrong. Expect your tasks to overrun. Try not to keep it to a solid 59 minutes because it's going to go wildly over schedule. Um, expect stalled talks. Expect to sit in silence for five minutes while you wait for people to contribute. Expect technological failure. Expect a reluctance to talk. Expect tasks to overrun. Again, I've, I've duplicated those things because they're doubly important and it's not at all a typo. Um, but while you put all this preparation into your carefully detailed lesson plans. The most important thing is to not overcomplicate anything that you do within a small group. You need to factor in some flexibility, some affordances, and you need to allow space for discussions to roll into something unexpected. Um, you need to ensure that your ideas and any tasks that you plan are simple enough for, for um, everybody to, to understand. And while you might want to immediately go to the award-winning pedagogical advancements, if you want your classes just to talk through some questions on the reading, they will understand that, they will do that, and they will spur really interesting discussions. The simple ideas are often the best ones. If you want to use technology, make sure that it serves the lesson. You'll hear people talk about Padlet and Jamboard and Tropy and any, any number of other fantastic learning facilitators, but it needs to serve the lesson. And it needs to serve the students as well. You need to think about accessibility and inclusivity. We need to think about the slides that we're using. We need to think about the reading that we're setting and make sure that all of that stuff serves every single person in the class. And if in doubt, you can just commandeer some whiteboards and some colored pens as well. That's a nice backup, but it's also a really, really successful way of teaching. So be prepared, but don't overcomplicate what you do when you go into a classroom. That will ensure that you are prepared for those challenges, you're prepared for any of those failures, but you don't overdo it when it comes to the opportunities. You don't go at, um, too far and, and make things tricky for everybody concerned. Um, and I can provide a very, very boring example of my own example lesson plans here. And this is basically how I have taught for the last like six years is something like this for a 60 minute seminar. This is what I would start with. I would set reading in advance of the class. I would have three, four, maybe five directed questions for that reading to spur knowledge. And I would have students come to class prepared to talk through the reading and those questions. I then break the classroom up into two halves in terms of, um, of time. So in the first half, I break the seminar up into small groups just with the people around them. They discuss those questions together. I work my way around the room. I answer any questions they might have there. And then I have sub questions and prodding things and probing things. I move on to the next group. And then I, after 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I bring the class together and we discuss their responses at a, as a group. I jot things down on a whiteboard. I ask follow-ups. I ask other people to disagree with one another. In the second half, we take a different source. We break the class up again. I discuss a different set of questions. I go around again. We come back together. We discuss their responses. And that would probably take a good 50, 55 minutes, which then gives me an opportunity to summarize the key points and provide an explanation for the uh, forthcoming week. Depending on the reading, depending on the learning objectives, that's all it needs to be. It doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. But as soon as you have that basis, as soon as you have that confident, comfortable idea of how to um, give a lesson, you can then start to elaborate on that, make it more complicated and try changing some of the tasks.
So in another 60 minute seminar, what I might do, same amount of reading, same directed questions beforehand, but then in the first half of the class, rather than just having them discuss those questions, I will position them each around a whiteboard or a big piece of paper, and I will have them group plan an essay based on one question, thinking about the source work, the argument, the analysis, the structure of an essay. I'll give them 10 minutes to do that. Once again, after 10 minutes, I've gone around, I bring them together, we discuss their essay, plan, uh, their essay plans. In the second half, I'll break the class back into groups again, but I will position them against a different whiteboard. I will position them against a different group's piece of work. And their job then is to evaluate someone else's essay plan, to offer suggestions, improvements, good comments. And once again, we come together, we talk, we collaborate, we discuss the, the, the sources, the arguments, the analysis, how they could have approached things, something else they might have been able to get out of the sources. Once again, we summarize, we explain what's going to happen the forthcoming week. It doesn't need to be any more advanced than that to begin with. And then you can become much more elaborate once you build that rapport with the students, once you get to know who they are, what they're capable of, the dynamics of the group, what your room looks like. So you can afford to have that patience for the first few weeks until you get to know this group of learners. And from after that, you can develop, you can become more elaborate, you've become more uh, overcomplicated. Um, I think I might be running out of time here, Jamie, so I might move on slightly from this big interactive session I was going to do on various task ideas, but feel free while I'm talking and jammering away here to put down any ideas that you might have into these text boxes and share your ideas, share your, um, your lesson plans, things that you could do within a small group. John, I, th I think you do have a bit of time if you need it, because we started... We started, started at half past, right? Yeah, yeah, so I think we've got a little bit okay. of, of wiggle take... room if you... We can take a couple of minutes then. Um, so based purely on the most basic or complicated lesson plan that uh, you have, any tasks that you could put down here that would fill 15 minutes that would develop some historical skills that would get people to um, uh, think about source work, think about essay planning. It could be source work. It could be skills-based stuff. It could be argumentative. It could be historiographical. Do you have any task ideas yourselves that you could fill into these boxes? I'm getting a couple down over here. Look at a topical news article and ask students about it. Yeah. An annotated bibliography? In what sense? Have students read secondary sources and summarize the thesis in one sentence. That's a, that's a really great one, actually, because, yeah, I know in certain groups of mine, the things that I've been trying to get them to develop is that skill in really fully understanding um, an argument from a secondary source um, just from an introduction or just from a conclusion, try and summarize that work within a single sentence. Essay plans and ask students to give feedback. Yeah, I, I really enjoy that one. I think it's a vital skill, um, but it, it, it can provide a lot of fun in the classroom as well if you put people in you know, collaboration and competition with one another. Um, split the classes in half and have a debate. I think somebody's written down there. Give out two different interpretations. Yeah, of a source of a reading of a particular historical event. I think what I'm finding here is that there is absolutely no dearth of, of talent, <laughs> of ideas, of um, exciting new developments in teaching that are going to come from you all. Um, Mentimeter polls, yeah, of course. Ask an introductory session. Um, at an introductory session, ask students to find a source that represents the history they're interested in. Um, yeah, use of Padlet and Talis Elevate to annotate text and sources there and then, or Google Docs or any number of these things. Deconstruct the short primary source. I think as soon as you break down um, any seminar into the, the time that you have and you factor in how long it's going to be to get people to come out of their shell, to talk to one another, to develop these ideas, you will probably have far less time to fill than you might think. You'll probably only get the opportunity to do one or two tasks per seminar. If that, if you factor in the importance of discussion, of group work and all those social aspects to classes as well. Obviously, if the seminar goes for two or three hours, if it's a much longer workshop, you can add in any number of these things. Um, but yeah, I think the, the thing I would encourage you to do is just think about the time that you have, the objectives that you need to meet. Um, and how best to, to spur that learning among the group. Um, but yeah, I think I'm going to move on now just to some very minor tips and hacks. Um, and then, yeah, a bit of a Q&A if there's, if there's still time. Um, so I try to crowdsource some 
some comments and suggestions from colleagues of mine and friends of mine. So some of these are just very specific, practical guidance that you might want to factor in. Um, and then some of them are a little more philosophical about, you know, how you develop as a, as a, as a learner, uh, as a teacher and as an instructor as well. Um, but the first thing that I, I got taught from everybody really was to be comfortable in the own expectations that, that you have about your classes. And this is probably isn't, you know, the most inspiring of advice, but to remember that not every class that you uh, lead needs to be award winning. It just needs to achieve the learning objectives. And it just needs to make sure that students have learned something from that class that they needed to learn. It doesn't have to be over elaborate. It doesn't have to use the newfangled thing. It just needs to do, um, um, just needs to meet those learning objectives. Um, but within that, that comfort, what you should do is develop an awareness of and a rapport with your students first. This might take a few weeks at the start of term and then work towards those more elaborate tasks when you become aware of what the class is capable of, what they would enjoy doing. Um, you need to optimize the environment, so scope out your teaching rooms in advance, make sure that you can, you can get into the room, make sure that the, the lecture, um, the uh, projector works and that the slides are gonna be visible from everywhere, and then tailor your teaching to the surroundings. That does provide some difficulties if you're in two different rooms for the same module, because there are certain things you can do with one group that you can't do with another. You're gonna to have to think about these, these things, but don't neglect the social aspects of your environment as well. Think about the seating positions, think about the friendship groups and the cliques that might develop among them and really um, kind of exploit those opportunities, those social aspects. So go to the room in advance, log in, test the technology, test the volume, test your slides, make sure they're visible, and then still expect failure anyway. Um, things are just gonna go wrong that are outside of your control. So always have a backup plan. I always have whiteboard markers in my bag in every classroom, and it is always successful. The simple things are often the best. Um, remember to seek students' feedback while you go as well. Get that constant um, uh, assurance that they're, that they're following your lesson plans. But you can probably work out ways to do this subtly and to integrate it into your teaching. Um, so rather than asking, do you have any questions, you can perhaps ask, what questions do you have? And that open question might, might just be a little more, um, more of a prompt. There might be more forthcoming from that. But something that um, I got told to do was at the end of a class, rather than me giving out the key points from the lesson, ask the students before they leave that they each have to give a key point that they took away. And in one sense, that summarizes the classroom, but you get a gauge on what they've taken away. And you can also perhaps um, develop that class the next time you teach it if there are certain things that haven't landed quite well. So seek students' feedback, but you can integrate that into your teaching. Um, and remember to um, SOS, which is really convoluted, apparently, and save you our slides. Um, just to remember, basically, that, that no time that you spend on lesson planning is wasted. Even if you only give that class the one time, you can save everything for future use and nothing will be wasted. Um, but yeah, in terms of the more philosophical things and to follow what Max um, was saying earlier, really, easier said than done. But the most important thing you can take away is confidence, really, and be aware of the fact that you are um, not just an expert in the, the field of history, but you are expert teachers as well. Um, don't be scared of the students, be kind, be enthusiastic, be open, be honest, be authentic, be inclusive with them, but never be scared of them. Um, similarly, don't assume interest in what you have planned. Um, you're there to inspire that learning. So even if you've got the most exciting thing that you, in the world that you're going to talk about, don't assume that everybody else is going to be interested in the same thing. Similarly, don't assume a lack of interest either even if people are bored and tired and and yawning it doesn't necessarily mean that they're tired and yawning because of the class they might have just had you know four hours of teaching beforehand and um, you need you have responsibility to to get them out of that um, but don't assume it's anything to do with you or anything to do with your subject matter um, remember that an excellent session with one group it will be a disaster with another group there's nothing you can do about that sometimes class dynamics just mean that um, but a teaching style is, is just the unique balance that you strike between various things. Um, and to provide an example of what I mean by that, I got told by my PhD supervisor when I started teaching that variety was the most important thing. There are different learning styles, different moods, different um, learning materials, different ways of teaching. And so have that variety, have every session be completely different. 
My second supervisor said that routine is the best way to approach these kind of things um, to ensure that there's clarity of expectation and that there are no surprises. So get as much advice as you can, but remember that there is no one size fits all solution to any of this. Um, there's no silver bullet to any problems that you might be facing, but that you are more than capable of overcoming any of these challenges. And to kind of make that more official, um, in 2014, the Higher Education Academy for, for STEM gave advice that you shouldn't let friends work together in subgroups in small group sessions because they become too cliquey. Um, but the RHS in 2020, I think, I can't remember who uh, authored this, talking about a lesson plan that they had, learned that, well, in future, it's probably best if students do work in friendship groups and they do choose their groups. So the guidance you get is probably going to be contradictory. Um, but it's, it's all about finding your own comfort zone and the things that you, you know work. So because securing your own knowledge, abilities and experience, you will and should develop your teaching style. Uh, and then you too can share your own good practice. And I think that's basically everything that I have to go on. Um, so if there are any questions, I will be very willing to answer anything that you might have. Sorry, I was just unmuting myself. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, John. You've got some positive feedback in the chat already um, saying how, how great it was and how useful the tips uh, were. Um, I really enjoyed it too. Um, so does, it, does anybody have any questions or, or follow-up comments on the, um, uh, in, the, in the chat? I mean, one thing I took away from it, which is more of a comment, is that, that I think you, you sort of, like Max, really, you, you um, personalised it. You showed like your own journey in a way that this isn't something that you necessarily comes naturally to everybody straight away. It's something that you um, sort of can develop and you, in a way, play with. If, you, if you're confident enough, you can sort of like try out different things and see how they work. And that, that over time develops the ability to be flexible and to have variety and things like that. I think that's, that's again, it's an important, um, that, that this is a kind of process that's never, it never really ends. Um, no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm constantly surprised that people ask me for advice on teaching because I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know from one day to the next whether something's been successful or not. Um, and we're all kind of, yeah, developing and learning as well. So it's just that, yeah, I think as a, as a kind of final point is to be like honest about the failures as well. If the technology crashes, I think Max has already said this as well, though, about if, if there's a typo on a slide, don't dwell on it just kind of make light of it and roll with it and i think that that does ingratiate you a lot with the students but um yeah it, it ensures that things don't get derailed and that there's a we can afford sometimes to let students behind the curtain almost and, and kind of tell them oh well that didn't work uh, let's try something else next time um yeah it can be quite helpful we have actually got a couple of questions in the chat um so should we should we do those and um one of them is how do you deal with um, international students in class who who don't speak very much and I guess I would also I mean from my perspective home students who don't talk very much um, in class could be added to that perhaps um it, it depends this this is where the, the advice and the guidance kind of falls down because it's going to depend entirely on that individual student and the the, the, the their circumstances for not talking but there's no substitute for just being kind of real and honest and authentic and kind. And I suspect that we all want the students to do well. Um, so maybe it'll just involve a, a meeting, a pastoral meeting and a side with the student. Maybe we can think about subtle ways that we can include them in certain groups. If we're aware that there is a really friendly, talkative group who get the material, when we break a class up into smaller groups, we could deliberately select groups. Or oh, this week, I'm going to put you into groups, actually. Um, that kind of stuff. I think it's yeah, it's it's very important to be aware of that more pastoral side of what we do. But there are any number of, of responses that I imagine you yourself would know kind of how to deal with this and just being aware of the individuality and the varieties. I think there are already some tips for the icebreaker questions coming in. So I don't know if that's necessary for me yeah. to, uh, to contribute to. I mean, one thing is that rather than asking for interest in facts from people, I've started asking for the most boring facts about them. Um, that tends to be quite lighthearted and a bit of a bit of a, a, a different challenge for people in the first week of term. Yeah, I did a, an exercise with um, 
because I've got a module called teaching history and I asked uh, we were doing about icebreakers and I asked the students to come up with icebreakers and that the thing that they said when we were reflecting on the exercise was the best sorts of icebreakers are ones that aren't exposing so you, what you want are uh, icebreakers that don't require the quiet students in particular to kind of open themselves up too much that, that allow them to put something out there that isn't kind of potentially threatening um, and I to, that they perceive that could be threatening so I think that's an important thing to think about um, so the one they came up with was um, my favorite one was um, the what's your favorite meal deal from um, from a supermarket which is a very uk thing but but and that, that that's that's one of the ones because nobody's going to be feel too attacked if somebody doesn't like their choice of sandwich um it's quite kind of a safe thing to get them to ask but it gets them talking anyway sorry that's totally random um, um any thoughts on teaching students from a range of disciplines um if, if, any any thoughts on that um I, I, I get it's, it's going it's, to, I'm not giving very good advice here, am I? Because it depends on the group, it depends on the disciplines again, but it will largely revolve around what it is you want the students to come away with from that. And you can think about the different disciplines as being a challenge, but there is also a huge opportunity for, for collaborative learning in, in, in there and for these kind of partnership communities, if you like. I mean, one thing that I did a few years ago, which was between, um, it was criminology, American studies, history, politics, English literature, media. And so what I did, whatever the topic was, I got them to bring, to, to find and to bring a short kind of article or, or a source relevant to their discipline. And then to teach somebody from outside of their discipline what this meant within the context of whatever the, the topic of that week was. Um, so a lot of these things are just spinning that, that potential drawback of having people talk across purposes, across disciplines into... Um, into something you can you can use to, to help you almost like recruiting unpaid teaching assistants almost <laughs> among the students in the classroom. Um, it's yeah, it provides that 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 dynamism, that collaboration. Um, a, a lot of the times, it's about just trying something and seeing if it works, and then not being too discouraged if it if it hasn't gone off, and if there are silences, you can kind of embrace that silence and just roll with the next seminar. Stuff, I think that's really really good advice the more that you can turn these potential uh, negative things around make them into a strength that's um great one question that i am gonna just pose to you now because i think it's something that lots of people worry about um and it gets to that issue of imposter syndrome i think what do you do if you don't know the answer to a question you you either ask the rest of the class what they think. So, oh, that's a really good question, actually. Does anybody else kind of know the answer to that? Um, you can throw it back and set it as homework for the following week and then have a quick Wikipedia Google of, of whatever the answer might be in, in, in your own free time. Or you can be honest and you can just say, oh, that's a really good question. I'm not actually sure about that. If stu I mean, there's been times in... I'm going very individual and idiosyncratic here. There's been uh, once in a class where I, I gave the wrong date down on the board and I just said it was a deliberate mistake and I expect them to catch me out for those kind of things. And I used it as a way of saying, I'm testing your knowledge. I want you to, to, to notice when I get these things wrong. I'm, you know, if you haven't noticed that that was wrong, that's on you. Um, but I, I don't think there's ever any problem in just saying that we don't know the answer to something either. I mean, it's not going to mean that you haven't got a PhD. I mean, I mean, you, you, you're still an expert in this stuff. There are certain things that, that you're not going to know that the students want to know. And, and yeah, it's, um, it's just time. It, it, it's, it's time and patience to develop your own um, teaching style and to, to become confident in, in, in what, you, what you know. But there really is very little difference between me giving this advice and, and kind of anybody who hasn't taught listening to it. It's just... It's just the time that I've had in a classroom has given me a bit of experience. I imagine you all have much better ideas on, on how to approach these things than I do. Um, Sadie has a really great point building up on that. What you just said, it helps to, it's transparent. It helps to humanize you. That It shows that you're, it's modeling them, modeling for them that you're in the same position as them in relation to some things rather than trying to pretend that you know everything. 
Um, and and sorry, Amy's point just above that as well about students appreciating the honesty and kind of seeing that their lecturer, their instructor, their seminar leader is also on that learning journey. I think that's a vitally important part of the small group teaching thing, which is that we're not there to have the answers and to tell them the answers. We're there to have a, a problem, if you like, and work together to solve it. It can be really good just for the transparency of that as well to say, oh, well, here we all are trying to learn these new things. I'm helping you, but we're all in this together. So yeah, really good points from Siri and from Amy there. Brill. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I think we'll, we've uh, interrogated John enough now, so we'll let him, um, yeah, uh, have a rest. And um, thanks again. Thanks so much. That was great. It was really instructive. And as I've been saying repeatedly to everybody, we'll, we'll, we'll make the recording available um, you can actually all, all already access the slides, but we'll make sure we download them as well, so they'll be they'll be put uh, they'll be made available to you elsewhere. Um, and 